Who really killed Kennedy? A lone lunatic? Or was it a coup d'etat involving U.S. intelligence agencies? On November, 24-year-old former Marine Lee Harvey Oswald had just gone to lunch, where he liked to eat alone sitting in a corner of the dining hall. The dining room was on the second floor of the six-story Texas School Book Depository Building, where Oswald worked part-time in the warehouse. Warehouse Secretary Caroline Arnolds saw Oswald at the lunch buffet around 12.15 p.m. as she was about to go outside to look at President Kennedy's motorcade passing by. Another warehouse employee, Boney Ray Williams, was having lunch sitting by a window on the sixth floor, not far from where the shots were later fired. He finished lunch and left around 12.15, 12.20. Boney later testified that he did not see any employees on the sixth floor. At this time, Oswald continues to be on the second floor waiting for an important call from his CIA handlers, but the phone goes silent. About 1.5 to 2 minutes after Kennedy's assassination, a patrol policeman searching the book depository building bumps into Oswald in the second floor cafeteria. An officer passing by tells the patrolman that Oswald works here, and the patrolman runs off. Asked by Oswald what happened, the officer replies, the president was murdered. The Warren Commission would later have the public believe that Oswald fired three shots in six seconds, covered his tracks and hid the rifle, rushed down from the sixth floor to the second floor, overtook two witnesses on the stairs, who did not see him, and in 90 seconds after shooting Kennedy, was in the second floor cafeteria, no panting, no matter what. What is Oswald doing in reality? He takes the time to leave the building through the back door, even though the police could seal the building at any moment. He takes a bottle of Pepsi from the vending machine and leisurely walks to the main exit, where he and several other warehouse employees calmly leave the building without being stopped or checked by the police who are already outside the building. All the shots were fired from the book depository, and almost 10 minutes had already passed. The police still had not given the order to seal the building or detain anyone who was there, which is very strange. Seeing the commotion outside, Oswald realizes that things are very serious. The president has been assassinated, and there has never been a call from the CIA. In fear, he rushes to his apartment, where he arrives about 30 minutes after Kennedy's assassination. At home, he takes his 38 caliber revolver and quickly leaves the apartment. Next, according to the Warren Commission, fabulous things begin to happen. Patrolman Tippett was killed between 1.15 and 1.20 minutes a mile and a half from Oswald's house, and there is not a single person who saw Oswald running down the street. He is believed to have been the one who shot the policeman and fled. At the same time, one of the witnesses to the officer's murder later did not recognize Oswald as the man who attacked the patrolman. Another woman who saw the patrolman killed from the porch of her home said there were two shooters and they fled in different directions. The two witnesses who saw the patrolman killed were never called to a Warren Commission hearing. At the same time, Oswald was at a movie theater in Texas, 5.5 kilometers away from where the policeman was killed 10 minutes later. Another interesting thing is that already at 12.44 p.m., 14 minutes after the president was killed, the police radioed the exact description of the killer and it matched Oswald's appearance exactly. Next, not far from the Texas movie theater, Oswald is seen by a shoe store owner who identifies him from the police radio. Oswald walks into the movie theater. He may have had an appointment there. The store owner follows Oswald to the movie theater and asks the cashier to call the police, after which about 30 patrol cars arrive at the movie theater. An incredibly amazing case of police intuition in catching criminals in history. And most likely the police were warned in advance that this particular movie theater would be where the president's killer would be. The police arrest Oswald and a crowd of reporters has already gathered outside the movie theater, cursing and cursing Oswald in every possible way even though he himself cannot understand why everyone is so furious at him. When Oswald was brought to the station, he was accused of killing a patrolman. No lawyer was provided, and hours of questioning were undocumented. The next morning, he was accused of murdering the president without even conducting an investigation. The whole country, thanks to the media hype, easily accepted that he was to blame. On the same day, Jack Ruby, a nightclub owner and gang member, infiltrates the parking lot below the precinct thanks to a friend from the Dallas police. Oswald is led into the parking lot by a group of investigators, reporters crowd around, and Ruby shoots him point-blank in front of everyone. It's over. Oswald dies on the spot. He's been sacrificed like a lamb to the slaughter. Within minutes, the story of Oswald, the assassin of President Kennedy, goes around the world. In America, they say that this day changed the world forever for the people of the United States. 
and this was only the first death in the whole story. Soon after these events, many witnesses who saw several gunmen on the day of the president's assassination would die under strange circumstances. Other witnesses will begin to recant their testimony. The investigation protocols will begin to disappear, as will the evidence. Miraculously, a 26-second documentary video shot by Abraham Zapruder in Dallas on the day of John F. Kennedy's assassination was found. The tape captures the movement of the presidential motorcade and the two shots hitting Kennedy in the neck and head. The tape would eventually play a very important role in the investigation of Jim Garrison, the New Orleans district attorney who would prosecute the banker Clay Shaw, whom Garrison would find guilty of complicity in the murder of John F. Kennedy. So, why couldn't Oswald be President Kennedy's assassin? One, aside from the story above about Oswald's detailed last day, which clearly shows that Oswald, not being Superman, could hardly have pulled off such a complicated operation on his own, there are several other inconsistencies mentioned in the Warren Commission. Two, there were more than one shooter. This is clearly seen in the Zapruder film, because the trajectory of the bullets was from different directions, not just from Kennedy's back. Three, if Oswald was not Superman, how could he have known the exact route of the president's motorcade, the time of his arrival, and prepared everything to make the assassination attempt alone? 4. The Magic Bullet Theory The first bullet, according to the official version, hit Kennedy in the back, went through and out through the neck, also wounding the back and wrist of John Connolly, who was sitting in front of him. It went through seven times in total. At the same time, when testifying before the Warren Commission, Connolly said that he was certain that he had been wounded by a second shot, which he did not hear. The members of the Warren Commission proposed the single bullet theory to resolve this controversy. They argued that Governor Connolly was hit by the same first bullet that struck the president in the back and exited through his throat. What can I say? Such a super bullet would be worthy of a separate video. Acoustic analysis of the shots. According to interviews with eyewitnesses, it turned out that 49 people heard shots from the side of the book depository. 21 people heard shots from the side of the grassy hill in front and to the right of the route of the presidential motorcade. Four more people said that they heard shots from other directions. As a result, by comparing all the evidence, we were able to conclude that six shots were fired from three different points. Points. Having said all this, I would like to say a few words about possible motives for Oswald's murder of JFK, and the point is, there are none. The Warren Commission was not provided with any evidence that suspect Oswald was part of any conspiracy against the president, whether by marginal groups or underground communist movements. If Oswald chose to do this for his own motives, what were his motives? After all, Oswald was a Marxist as he said of himself, and Kennedy at the time went about rapprochement with the Soviets. So personal motives for killing the president make no sense. I would like to point out that the age of great men's deaths did not end with John F. Kennedy. On June 5, 1968, just after delivering his victory speech in the provisional election, Robert Kennedy was fatally shot by the Palestinian terrorist Sirhan Bashara Sirhan and died the next day, June 6. Bobby Kennedy continued to pursue the policies of his late older brother. He was also assassinated in front of hundreds of people, in a manner clearly reminiscent of the public execution that befell John F. Kennedy. The same sad fate befell Martin Luther King Jr., the American human rights activist who was murdered in Memphis, Tennessee on April 4, 1968, at the age of 39. Let's consider the theory that the CIA and other intelligence agencies were aware of the Kennedy assassination attempt and may have even organized it. There were numerous records of security failures on the president's arrival in Dallas on the day of the assassination. There were no Secret Service agents on the scene that day, nor prior to the day of the assassination, only a few personal bodyguards riding in the president's car and escorting him. However, immediately after the assassination, the police encountered various characters who showed Secret Service identification and soon disappeared from the scene. No one saw them again. Twelve people were detained that day, but not a single report was ever drawn up. These men also disappeared. Kennedy was driving in an open car and it was moving very slowly. An unplanned turn was made. Even a child with a slingshot could have shot the president if he wanted to. There were no perimeter snipers deployed that day, no Secret Service observers. It felt like President Kennedy was being led to the slaughter, knowing what was going to happen. So they didn't bother to keep him safe. Let us touch upon the motives of the intelligence services for the assassination of Kennedy. One. Kennedy wanted to abolish the influence of the Federal Reserve on the economy. If he had succeeded, the people behind this institution would have lost the ability to print money and lend it to the government at interest rates. The plan to enslave the people of the United States, and not just the United States, would have been foiled. 2. Kennedy wanted to stop the war in Vietnam, which brought in the end about $220 billion to the military-industrial complex of the USA and corporations making arms. Huge money and who cares that 58,000 American soldiers were killed in Vietnam, not to mention the 2 million million dead, wounded, and missing Vietnamese. 
Kennedy wanted to cut off the hand of one of the most lucrative business scams, because it is the government that uses taxpayers' money to buy weapons for waging wars from private corporations, and those corporations get immensely rich from this cooperation. 3. Kennedy fought the CIA, which had unlimited powers, and did what it wanted under the seal of secrecy, organizing revolutions in various banana republics, coups, political assassinations, preparing the invasion of Cuba by counter-revolutionaries, etc. The CIA was essentially a state within a state, and it was impossible to control them. Kennedy wanted to level the power of the CIA by fragmenting it into many smaller agencies and forcing it to be punished for its involvement in various military operations against other countries in peacetime. To this end, the Kennedy administration was preparing the appropriate orders and documents. Kennedy decided to defy the lion, and that was the reason to remove him. In essence, the CIA and the like are the fifth column inside the country and are in place not to protect the nation from enemies, but rather to hide internal enemies and keep the people from knowing the truth about how they are being deceived. Otherwise, the crowd, maddened by the truth, will simply wipe out the government. Oswald Bio GRFAD, Dark Cardinal In the whole Kennedy assassination story, the Harvey Oswald's biography, and the things that seem very strange when you read them play an important role. Oswald was a full-time CIA agent. He was in the Navy in military intelligence, studying Russian. His co-workers called Oswald Oz Rabbit, and sometimes Oswald Skovich, Oswald Skovich, because of his pro-Soviet views. In October 1959, shortly before his 20th birthday, Oswald comes to the Soviet Union. This trip is planned in advance. On October 31, Oswald appeared at the U.S. Embassy in Moscow, stating that he wished to renounce his American citizenship. The U.S. Marine's flight to the Soviet Union was reported on the front page of the Associated Press and other newspapers in 1959. The Soviets give Oswald permission to live in the USR. He lives in Minsk, works as a turner at the Lenin radio plant in Minsk, and marries a local girl. Oswald was a traitor. It is believed that in exchange for the possibility of living in the USR, he leaked to the KGB information about the secret aircraft of the US Air Force, which he could have learned while serving at the US Air Force base in Japan. Very soon, Oswald became disillusioned with life in the USR. In the early summer of 1962, Oswald returned to the United States with his wife and daughter. He was again given American citizenship and was not charged with treason, which is very strange, don't you think? He's like a Superman. He continues to work for the CIA again at the New Orleans branch of the Secret Service. After reading Oswald's very strange biography, it begs the question, who was he really? The feeling was that a character like Oswald, who was also mentally unstable, was the perfect candidate to assassinate the president, a scapegoat to blame. It is possible that he was a Manchurian candidate, a brainwashed special agent. His strange trips to the USR, then his return home without any problems look as if he was hypnotized or was performing an operation of the highest secrecy. But one thing is clear, Oswald was not just an ordinary serviceman, but rather was chosen for one important special operation in the future, the assassination of the President of the United States. Thus, it becomes clear why Oswald was sent to the USR. This is how the US Secret Service wanted to discredit Oswald to the public and make him look like a psychopath and possibly a double agent. The CIA myth goes like this. Oswald learns Russian, considers himself a Marxist, is recruited in the Navy, then is given a mission and flies to the USR. There he defected to the Soviets, he is recruited by the KGB, and on returning home he becomes a wolf in sheep's clothing, a double agent. This gives the impression that Oswald was really out of his mind and did incomprehensible and contradictory things, which makes him a good fit for the role of a psychopathic killer. All the secret services actively cooperate with each other, were the words of one journalist. Why would the KGB let Oswald go home so easily? What if he had discovered important Soviet secrets? But if we assume that the US and Soviet intelligence agencies at the very top cooperated with each other, then it becomes clear. Such a frivolous attitude towards Oswald in both the US and the USR. Conclusion Kennedy wanted to abolish conflict in a bipolar world between the great powers, to create conditions for peaceful coexistence between nations. But for those who make wars and make billions from them, peace is the end of business. The control system and the secret services behind it are constantly busy creating an enemy for the sake of terrorizing their own population. It does not matter if that enemy is Vietnam, the USR, Cuba, or any other aggressor country. Fear allows the intelligence services to stand in the shadows at the helm of the state and influence its laws, politicians, and public opinion. Without an enemy, there is no need for intelligence services. Kennedy defied the CIA and paid for with his life. Oswald became a scapegoat, a psychopath who did all the dirty work for the Secret Service and became a Judas in his own country, even though by all accounts he was a very unhappy and sickly man. 
What would you like to see next video on our channel? Tell us in the comments.